Thank you. I'm going to start my remarks with a question. The question is, where does my title come from? A decent respect to the opinions of humankind. Is that a familiar phrase to anyone? Well, today our Consul General is celebrating the independence of the United States, which our holiday is in fact, was in fact a week earlier. It was on July 4th, and that was the date that the Declaration of Independence was pronounced. And in the very first paragraph, the people who declared the independence of the United States from the United Kingdom thought that out of a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, you see I made one change, I made it humankind, out of a decent respect, the United States, the new nation, was going to declare the causes for its separation. And then the declaration lists all the reasons why the United States was separating from the United Kingdom. So from the very beginning, there was concern about the United States becoming a nation in a world of nations. What Thomas Jefferson wanted to do, he was the principal draft of the Declaration of Independence, was to expose the reasons for the United States becoming a nation to the scrutiny of what he called a candid world. Well, the founding generation recognized that becoming a nation in a world of nations meant that what we do would be watched by other lands, and it also meant that we would become a participant in the formulation, recognition, and enforcement of international law. So Article 6 of our Constitution makes treaties the supreme law of the land. And among the powers that were given to the Congress is the power to define and punish offenses against the law of nations. The law of nations is what we today call international law. And the very first Congress in 1789 passed what's known as the Alien Tort Act, which empowers federal courts to hear cases brought by an alien for a tort committed in violation of the law of nations. Doesn't specify where the wrong was committed, but an alien could sue in our courts for violation of international law. John Jay, who was the very first Chief Justice of the United States, expressed the common understanding when he wrote in 1793 that by taking a place among the nations of the earth, the United States had become amenable to the law of nations and so it has been ever since. Our fourth Chief Justice, the great jurist John Marshall, drew a distinction important to understand. He distinguished the law of nations, which binds US courts. It is the law that binds all nations. He distinguished that from the law and judicial decisions decisions of foreign countries, which do not bind U.S. courts. In an 1815 decision, John Marshall explained that the law of nations is part of the law of the United States because of our membership in a world of nations. But the decisions of foreign tribunals, the laws passed by foreign legislatures, um, to, to govern their own domestic systems, 
Those are surely not controlling authority for U.S. courts, but, John Marshall added, decisions of the courts of other countries merit respectful attention for their potential persuasive value when they deal with problems similar to those we encounter. For the most part, in the over two centuries since John Marshall headed the U.S. judiciary, both federal and state courts have understood the difference between international law, part of our law, and foreign law, from which we can be informed. We can learn from how jurists abroad have resolved problems resembling those we face. There was published in 2005 in the William and Mary Law Review a comprehensive article that runs some 166 pages filled with examples showing that from the very beginning courts in the United States have taken account of foreign law and the decisions of foreign courts. I will digress for a moment with a bit of personal history. I will tell you how I became interested in international and comparative law. I was two years out of law school, long before most of you were born, in 1961. And the Columbia Law School asked me if I would take part in their project on international procedure, and particularly if I would co-author a book with a Swedish judge on the stirring title, Civil Procedures in Sweden. Well, the book was part of a series in which a U.S. author teamed with a lawyer from a country whose system was described. Sweden was chosen because in the 1940s, it revised its code of judicial procedure and deliberately attempted to infuse into their basically civil law code what they conceived to be the best of the Anglo-American system. The other two countries involved in the series of books were France and Italy. The German system had already been studied in two comprehensive articles published in the Harvard Law Review. Well, I had no familiar ties with Scandinavia, so I wondered, why me? There was a commercial payoff in knowing something about the French and the Italian systems, but Sweden has a rather small population, and the only clear benefit for me would be understanding the language spoken in Ingmar Bergman films. Um, I suspected that Columbia, when it came to the Swedish study, looked down the list of women graduates, and that's how I got that assignment. Well, the work proved enormously enlightening. Not that there was anything in the Swedish system to be borrowed lock, stock, and barrel in the United States, but I came to see that our way of doing things was not necessarily the only way, and to understand that what is right for one system may not be right for another, but also to recognize that we could learn from other systems in, de in endeavoring to reform our own modes of procedure. Other informing experiences in those years, I served on the board of editors of the American Journal of Comparative Law from 1964 until 1972, and I participated in periodic meetings of the International Academy of Comparative Law in Hamburg, Uppsala, and most memorable for me, in Pescara, in the Red Sea. So in the 1970s, when I was urging courts in the United States 
to recognize as constitutional principle the equal citizenship right of men and women. It seemed to me useful to cast a comparative side lens. The first case in point, Read v. Read, was decided in 1971, and it proved to be the turning point gender discrimination case in the United States Supreme Court. Read v. Read involved an Idaho statute that provided, as between persons equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, males must be preferred to females. Just that simple. The plaintiff was a woman from Boise, Idaho, Sally Reed, whose te teenage son died under tragic circumstances. Sally and her husband, the boy's father, were divorced, and when the boy was young, Sally was given custody because the child was the expression used in United States family law is of tender years. But when the boy re reached his teens, the father applied to the family court judge and said, now he has to be prepared to live in a man's world. So I should be his custodian. And the judge agreed, much to Sally Reed, mother's distress. She regarded that decision as a great mistake, and she proved right. The boy died of a shot fired from one of his father's many rifles. So Sally wanted to be appointed administrator of her son's estate, which consisted of a few books, a record collection, a guitar, some clothes, and a very small bank account. So there was no financial reason for her wish to serve as administrator. Her former husband applied about 10 days later, and the probate court judge told Sally, I have no choice. The law says males must be preferred to females. Well, as of 1971, the United States Supreme Court never saw a gender classification it didn't like or at least thought was unconstitutional. The precedents that existed held that it was all right for the state of Michigan to reserve the job of bartending to men unless the woman was the wife or the daughter of the male tavern owner, that was one. Women were not called to serve on juries at the time. There were a host of laws in our states and in the U.S. Code differentiating between men and women. So, when I wrote the brief on Sally Reed's behalf, I looked to two foreign decisions. They were both rulings of the then West German Constitutional Court. One involved a provision of the German Civil Code that stated, when the parents disagree about the education of the child, father decides. The West German Constitutional Court held that provision incompatible with the country's post-World War II Constitution, which explicitly recognized the equal citizenship stature of men and women. The second case from the same court involves succession to large farms. To avoid Fragmenting the estate into small parcels, the law provided that the eldest son would inherit the whole. Never mind, the eldest son might have had older sisters. Well, that law, too, was um, unconstitutional. 
When I referred to those two, two decisions, I never expected that the U.S. Supreme Court would refer to them in its opinion, and it did not. But I thought it might have persuasive effect, psychological effect. The message I tried to convey is if this is where the West German Constitutional Court is, in its understanding of equality, how far behind can the U.S. Supreme Court be? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court didn't remain in the rear. It unanimously declared that the Idaho male preference statute was unconstitutional. And throughout the decade of the 70s, there were dozens of federal and state laws that were similarly declared impermissibly discriminatory against women, some of them against men. Well, flash forward with me now to the hearings held in July 2010 on the nomination of my colleague, Elena Kagan, for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. Questions about international and foreign law were several times posed by members of the Senate committee the Committee on the Judiciary, one senator expressed dismay that during Justice Kagan's tenure as dean of the Harvard Law School, first-year students were required to take a course in international law. Another senator ventured, nowhere did the founders say anything about using foreign law. That senator was quite misinformed. Uh, please explain, the senator asked Justice Kagan, why it is okay sometimes to use foreign law to interpret our constitution, our statutes, our treaties. And yet another asked whether judges should ever look to foreign law for good ideas or to get inspiration for their decisions from foreign lands. Nominee Kagan responded with her typical good humor. I'm in favor of good ideas, she said, wherever you can get them. <laughs> Having awareness of what other nations are doing might be useful, she added. As an example, she referred to a brief she had filed the very same year when she was our Solicitor General, the officer who represents the United States before the Supreme Court, she had filed a brief concerning um, the immunity of foreign officials from suit, and she had referred to the law of several countries on that point. Of course, she clarified, on a point of U.S. law, foreign decisions do not write as precedent, but they could be informative in much the same way as one might gain insight from reading a law review article. I'm troubled, a senator dissatisfied with her answer said, that she believes we can turn to foreign law to get good ideas. So some of our legislatures need education in that regard, and I hope that Wake Forest and other law faculties will, will bear that in mind. Well, it is true that for much of the United States history, our courts were virtually alone in exercising the power of judicial review for constitutionality because in mo most nations, the principle of parliamentary supremacy held firm, leaving the courts no role to play in measuring ordinary laws and executive acts against the prescriptions contained in a fundamental instrument of government. But particularly in the work the years following World War II, many nations, Italy among them, installed constitutional review by a constitutional court 
as one safeguard against oppressive government and stirred up majorities. National, multinational, and international human rights charters and courts today play a prominent part in our world. On this development, my first boss, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, wrote in 1999 in a, in, in a forward to a collection of essays on comparative constitutional law. He wrote, for nearly a century and a half, courts in the United States, exercising the power of judicial review for constitutionality, had no precedence to look to save their own, because our courts alone exercise that sort of authority. When many new constitutional courts were created after the Second World War, those courts naturally looked to decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court, among other sources, for developing their own law. But now that constitutional law is solidly grounded in so many countries, it is time that the United States courts begin looking to the decisions of other constitutional courts to aid in their own deliberative process. Justice O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, spoke to the same point a few years later. She said, while ultimately we must bear responsibility for interpreting our own laws, there is much to learn from distinguished jurists in other places who have given thought to the same difficult issues we face here. That is exactly right, I believe. It is the very point that Justice Kagan made when she appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee. A related point I would like to stress, recall that the founding generation showed concern for how adjudication in U.S. courts would be viewed by other countries. John Marshall, in an 1816 opinion, said that the U.S. judiciary would con confront cases in which foreign nations are deeply interested and in which the principles of the law and comedy of nations often form an essential inquiry. Today, uh, even more than when the United States was a new nation, judgments rendered in the USA are subject to the scrutiny of a candid world. Yes, there have been throughout our history discordant views on the attention we should pay to the opinions of humankind. A mid-19th century Chief Justice of the Supreme Court wrote, no one, we presume, supposes that any change in public opinion or feeling in the civilized nations of Europe or in this country should induce the courts to give the words of the Constitution a more liberal construction than they were intended to bear when the instrument was framed and adopted. Those words were penned in 1857 they appear in Chief Justice Roger Tawney's opinion for a divided court in Dred Scott v. San Stanford, an opinion that invoked the majestic due process clause of the Constitution to uphold one individual's right to hold another in bondage. It was a decision that hastened our civil war. Well, as indicated by my quotations from the remarks of some of our senators at Justice Kagan's confirmation hearing, U.S. judges and political actors today divide sharply on the propriety of looking beyond our nation's borders and particularly on matters touching on fundamental human rights. Expressing spirited opposition, my dear colleague, Justice Antonin Scalia, 
and counsels that the court should cease putting forward foreigners' views as part of the reason basis of our decisions. To invoke alien law when it agrees with one's own thinking and ignore it otherwise is not reason decision making, he said, but sophistry. In a 2005 published conversation between Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer, Justice Scalia said, well, it was all right for Justice Breyer to inform himself on international legal developments, but he should keep the information out of his opinions. A qualification. Just this March, in a dissenting opinion, Justice Scalia took aim at a majority decision extending the right to effective assistance of counsel to plea bargaining. Justice Scalia observed, in many, perhaps most countries of the world, US-style plea bargaining is forbidden. In Europe, many countries adhere to what they aptly call the legality principle by requiring prosecutors to charge all prosecutable offenses. Such a system, Justice Scalia said, reflects an admirable belief that the law is the law and those who break it should pay the penalty provided. Another trenchant critic of comparative side glances is a well-known Court of Appeals judge Richard Posner, who sits on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. He commented that to cite foreign law is to flirt with the discredited idea of a universal natural law, or to suppose fantastically that the world's judges constitute a single elite community of wisdom and conscience. Judge Posner's view rests in part on the concern that U.S. judges do not comprehend the social, historical, political, and institutional background from which foreign opinions emerge. Nor do most of us even understand the language in which the laws and judgments outside the common law realm are written. Judge Posner is right, of course, to this extent, as Justice Kagan carefully reiterated in her responses to the senators, foreign opinions are not authoritative, they set no binding precedent for the U.S. judge, but they can add to the store of knowledge relevant to the solution of trying questions. Yes, we should approach foreign legal materials with senses sensitivity to our, own, to our differences and our imperfect understanding. But imperfection, I believe, should not lead one to abandon the effort to learn what we can from the experience and wisdom foreign sources may convey. And we should take care, as Chief Justice Tony did not, about serving about U.S. decisions, U.S. law, serving as a source of negative authority abroad. The U.S. Attorney General pressed that point in a friend of the court brief he filed on behalf of the United States in Brown v. Board of Education, the challenge to public school segregation that was decided in 1954. The Attorney General urged the court to put an end to the separate but equal doctrine. The Attorney General wrote, the existence of discrimination against minority groups in the United States has had an adverse effect upon our relations with other countries. Racial discrimination raises doubts even among friendly nations as to the intensity 
of our devotion to the democratic faith. What perplexes me most about the critics of looking beyond our borders, judges in the United States are free to consult reams of published material, all manner of law review articles published by professors, and even the work of students in our law journals. We often consult restatements, treatises, and nowadays, any number of legal blogs inform us. But if we can consult those sources without any restraint, why not the analysis of a question similar to one we confront, contained, for an example, in an opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, the Supreme Court of Israel, the German Constitutional Court, the European Court of Human Rights. Henry Fielding wrote in one of his novels that examples work more forcibly on the mind than precepts, and so with that counsel in mind, I will give you a few examples of some fairly recent Supreme Court decisions involving foreign and international legal sources as an aid to resolution of constitutional questions. In a headline 2002 decision, Atkins v. Virginia, a six-member majority, all save the Chief Justice, Justice Scalia, and Justice Thomas, held unconstitutional the execution of a mentally retarded offender. The court noted that within the world community, the imposition of the death penalty for crimes committed by a mentally retarded offender is overwhelmingly disapproved. And the next year, the court looked beyond our borders in a case titled Lawrence v. Texas, Overruling a 1986 decision, the judgment in Lawrence declared unconstitutional a Texas statute that prohibited two adult persons of the same sex from engaging voluntarily in intimate sexual conduct. On respect for the opinions of humankind, the Lawrence court emphasized the right the petitioners seek in this case has been accepted as an integral part of human freedom in many other countries. In support, the court cited a leading 1981 decision of the European Court of Human Rights, Dudgeon against the United Kingdom, and a number of subsequent follow-up rulings by the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, affirming the protected right of gay and lesbian adults to engage in intimate consensual conduct. The current Supreme Court has several times shown a decent respect for the opinions of humankind in cases arising out of the war on terror. In June 2008, the court held in a case called Boumedian against Bush that Congress had acted unconstitutionally when it eliminated federal court jurisdiction to pe hear petitions for habeas corpus, that is, the person who is incarcerated can use the great writ to say, why am I being held? What reason does the government have to hold me in prison? Well, Congress said that the courts would not have such authority with respect to detainees in Guantanamo Bay. The court held that law unconstitutional. It had already laid the groundwork in an earlier decision, Hamden against Rumsfeld. There the court held that the president, acting on his own without any congressional authorization, could not order the trial of Guantanamo Bay detainees by military 
commissions. Even in our most challenging and uncertain moments when our nation, when our nation's commitment to due process is most severely tested, Justice O'Connor wrote, and for the majority, we must preserve our con commitment at home to the principles for which we fight abroad. History and common sense, she reminded, teach us that an unchecked system of detention carries the potential to become a means for oppression and abuse. Now, I must add a P.S. The court had held that the president lacked authority on his own to authorize military commissions. But the year after our decision, Congress passed a law giving the president that authority. And we have yet to rule on that law. Two University of Chicago law school professors recently published their disagreement with what Justice O'Connor said. People do not prefer liberty to death, they wrote. A government that does not contract civil liberties in face of terrorist threats, uh, those professors said, is pathologically rigid, not enlightened. Yet what greater, what greater defeat could we suffer than to come, because of our concern for security, more and more to resemble the forces we oppose in their disregard for human dignity. One further illustration, the court in March 2005 decided Roper against Simmons. In that case, they held unconstitutional the execution of persons under the age of 18 who had committed capital crimes. The court in that case acknowledged the overwhelming weight of international opinion against the juvenile death penalty. Justice Kennedy, writing for the court, expressed the opinion that the world community provides respected and significant confirmation of our own conclusions. It does not lessen our fidelity to the U.S. Constitution, he explained, to recognize the express affirmation of certain fundamental rights by other nations and people in a decision rendered just last month, the court extended that ruling and held it unconstitutional to impose a mandatory sentence of life without the possibility of parole for juveniles, even those who commit murder. While recognizing that predictions are always risky, I nonetheless believe that the U.S. Supreme Court will continue to accord a decent respect to the opinions of humankind as a matter of comedy and also in a spirit of humility. Comedy because projects vital to, to our own well-being, combating international terrorism is a prime example, require trust and cooperation among nations the world over and humility because, in Justice O'Connor's words, other legal systems continue to innovate, to experiment, and to find solutions to the new legal problems that arise each day, solutions from which we can learn and benefit. In this regard, I was impressed by an observation made in September 2003 by Israel's then Chief Justice, Aharon Barak. September 11, he noted, confronts the United States with the dilemma of conducting a war on terror without sacrificing the nation's most cherished values, including our respect for human dignity. We in Israel, Barak said, 
have had our September 11, September 12, and so on. He spoke of his own court's brave efforts to balance the government's no doubt compelling need to secure safety of the state and of its citizens on the one hand, and a proper regard for human dignity and freedom on the other. The question before the court, before the Supreme Court of Israel was, is it lawful to use violence, and violence was a euphemism for torture, in interrogating a terrorist in a ticking bomb situation? That is, if the police think that a person they have arrested knows where and when a bomb will explode, what means can the police use to extract that information? Aharon Barak, in an eloquent decision for his court, answered, no, never use violence. He elaborated, it is the fate of a democracy that not all means are acceptable to it, not all methods employed by its enemies are open to it. Sometimes a democracy must fight with one hand tied behind its back. Nonetheless, it has the upper hand, preserving the rule of law and recognition of individual liberties constitutes an important component of a democracy's understanding of security. At the end of the day, those values buoy up its spirit and strength and its capacity to overcome the difficulties. And that is an opinion in which I concur without Reservation. Well, you have been a very patient audience, and I would like now to invite your questions. <laughs>